and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you in the name of Jesus.
You should have been there when I prayed through. Church was on fire and the Holy Ghost too. From the top of my head to the sole of my feet. Felt the Spirit moving all over me. You should have been there when I prayed through. Church was on fire and the Holy Ghost too. From the top of my head to the sole of my feet. Felt the Spirit moving all over me. Jesus. And if you're here tonight and you ain't been to the living water yet, I guarantee you somebody can baptize you in the name of Jesus. And I promise you, you can come up speaking in another language as the Spirit gives utterance. Hallelujah. What we're about to do as communion together is the reason we can sing that song. Because had it not been for Jesus going to that cross, we would not be able to have salvation. What we're going to do tonight, ladies, is I'm going to read the scripture to you. And if you've not used these, there's two tabs. The small clear one peels back. That's, of course, the bread. And then the second one will be the wine. What I want you to do is if you'd get the bread ready, if you don't have communion, would you just raise your hand? We do have some ushers if you need that. Okay, looks like everybody does. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. There's some back here. 
I want you to put the bread just between your two fingers and your thumb like this. Because in a moment, I'm going to ask everybody to be quiet. We're going to snap it together. So don't, don't do it just yet. But I'm going to read the scripture as they're handing out some more to make sure everybody has. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23, says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. The Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lamb. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. In the study I have done of all of the times that the priests would bring the Lamb together, I have yet to find one time in Scripture or even in history wherever a priest judged the sinner. Yet, they would carefully examine the lamb. And if the lamb was found to be without spot or blemish, it didn't matter the sin, it didn't matter the gravity of the sin, it didn't matter what had happened or how many times, the lamb was found to be worthy. The blood would roll it ahead. John was the son of a priest. And on that day by the Jordan River, he lifted up his eyes and he looked and he saw Jesus coming. And he had examined the lamb. Only this time, it wouldn't roll sins ahead. The first time we see a lamb in the Bible is with Abel. It's a lamb for a man. One of the next times we see a lamb is at the uh, exodus from Egypt. It's a lamb for a family. Later in the wilderness, it's a lamb for a nation. But when Jesus was seen by John, John said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away, not rolls ahead, takes away the sin of the world. In other words, he had examined the lamb and said, I find no fault in him. No matter the sin, no matter the problem, no matter the issue, the blood of the Lamb can cover it. Had it not been for that broken body and that spilled blood, we would not be here tonight. Or at least not at a ladies' conference. It would be something else entirely different. So I want you to take that bread between your fingers with your thumb. And together, just everybody just get quiet for a moment. and I want us to snap that together. Are you ready? Let's do that. His body was broken for me. Would you take the bread now? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You have your cups ready. There was also a cup that was passed that night. Those disciples first shared. Let's receive the cup, the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. After you have taken it, I wonder if you could just thank the Lord for everything He's forgiven you of, for that blood that washed over your life. I believe I'm looking at a lot of such were some of yous tonight that had it not been for the blood, there would be a different story, but because of the blood, you are a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's the miracle of the power of the blood. Nearly 2,000 years later, it still cleanses. It still washes. It still justifies. It still sanctifies. And it's here tonight for whosoever will. Come on, let's bless him. There's a miracle in this house. There's a miracle here tonight. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hear our cry. Be lifted high in this Lord, we want you. No one else will.
you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God, you are here. Thank you, Lord, for you are a miracle. You are our miracle, God. I feel his presence so strong. Let's just wait on the Lord for a little bit. sensitive to the Lord if he's speaking to you. Let's respond to the word of God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for your word. Thank you for coming and being with us today. Thank you for speaking into us today, God. We worship you. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you. We thank you, Lord, for your presence. We thank you, God, for the blood that was shed on Calvary for us. I thank you, God. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You're so good, God. You're so good, God. You're so good, God. You're so good. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Let's just give him a hand of praise right now. Thank him for his presence. Thank him for his love for us, his grace, his mercy. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Those of you that are praying, you can continue to pray, but we're going to move on. You may be seated. We would like to... At this time, honor uh, our bishop and Sister Powell, wherever he went. I'm not sure where he went. Sister Powell's right here. Maybe he left already. We're asking Sister Powell to come up. And um, if you would come up, Sister Powell. Also, Sister Michelle Anthony. Isn't Bethel an incredible place for us to come? Hats off to Bethel. Justin and Michelle Anthony, pastors of this church, and we want to thank you, Justin and Michelle Anthony, for um, just letting us have it here. 
It's such a beautiful facility. We know it takes a lot of work. We know it takes a lot of work with your people, cleaning, prepping, and all the things. And we just want, can we, can we give a hand to them and to Bethel? And we want to honor them. I know their husbands are not with them today, but we would like to honor them today. For they're on the district board, and they do things behind the scenes that probably a lot of us don't see, but they're behind their husbands, and we, we, we honor the husbands. And so thank you. Thank you so much. We also would like to have... I don't want these ladies to be upset at me, but I love these ladies dearly with my whole heart. And I would like Sister Wolf and Sister Huffman to come to the front. There are former ladies presidents. Would you come to the front, please? We want to honor you. Leadership builds on leadership, amen? And this, these ladies have given their lives to the Nebraska Ladies Ministries, and we want to honor them today and tell them how much we love them. Come right over here, dear. Come over here. We, we want to see you. We want to see you. I love you. I love you. Thank you. Nebraska is a great place. And leaders come and they continue to lead even though maybe the position is changed they still lead amen they're still examples and we give honor to you sister wolf and sister huffman we love you we love you this next person is really going to be mad at me you may be seated well you may want to stand because she is pretty amazing so my mom sister anthony my beautiful mom, she doesn't got to come all the way to the top because I know it's, it's hard for her, but if she can make her way, I want to tell you <laughs> that I wouldn't beat what I am today if it wasn't for my mom. She is behind the scenes in so much. They were the du district superintendents for eight years, and they led this district as well very, very amazingly, and um, their leadership, we're still gleaning off of their leadership and the nuggets that they have, but I want to tell you that I love you, Mom, and thank you for being my best friend. Love you, love you. Guys, I know this is taking just a little bit, so I'm sorry, but we, this needs to happen. Give honor where honor is due, right? That's what the Bible says. Amen? I would like for our committee, where is our committee? Sister Michelle, Sister Angela, Sister Alicia, our district lady secretary. I want to tell you guys, this is not a one-man show. This is probably a 20-man show. Because there's some of you out there that has helped us. You've decorated, you've cleaned, you've done amazing things. Our hat's off to you. But I want to tell our team what an amazing group of ladies you are. And you're my friends. And I love you. I have something very special for you. These are, it's hard to hold the mic and do all this at the same time. But we're all going to do it. I love you. One's for Shelly. Okay. This is going to be really, really hard. And I, you guys do not have to stand. You guys, are, you guys can be seated. I uh, want to give a special thank you to our Nebraska Ladies Secretary, Alicia Kirkpatrick. She has put in her resignation as secretary because she wears so many hats. And she has served the Nebraska ladies for two years amazingly alongside her mom and other people that are, help her. But she has done an amazing job. And this job, 
would this ladies, Nebraska ladies would not be where it is without her help, registration, her smile, all the things she does behind the scenes. And I want to thank you from my heart for being the Nebraska Ladies Secretary. And I know that your leadership's not going to be done here, but it's just going to rise and it's going to go places. We got her a $75 gift card to Hobby Lobby. It's in the bag. And $75 gift card to Amazon. Some special things in here. I love you. You need another hand. I love you. I love you. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. You guys can be seated. So, now that that's done, I just want to tell you, but this could not happen without you. Because we couldn't be here today and have this amazing time of ladies' conference without each of you and your smiles, your beautiful faces, your hunger for God. That's what brings the presence of God is your hunger, your dedication, your sacrifice. So thank you for all that you do to the offering. Okay. Um, and if you could just stay right here for one second. Um, um, Sister Patterson, let me find this because I had to write some things down. Um, because, you know, you get up here and you forget what you meant to say. <laughs> and, um, and I didn't want to forget anything. And now I can't find it. Here we go. Um, I get the extreme honor tonight of honoring our amazing ladies president, Sister Sherry Patterson. Um, if you could come back over here. <laughs> Sherry and John have served the Nebraska District for 23 years, and for at least the last eight of those years, um, Sister Patterson has served in the ladies' department. To know Sister Patterson is a blessing. If you know her, you are blessed. And I have been blessed by knowing her since I was five years old. <laughs> I could stand here and tell you memory after memory, um, but I don't have that much time. <laughs> but I do love her so, and I am very honored to be your friend. Um, I have so enjoyed working with the ladies department for the last two years. I have learned so much from working with Sister Patterson, um, and she has been ever so patient with me, and she has taught me. Um, she's, Sherry is so many things. We, could, we cannot name all of them, but some things I wanted to highlight. She is so talented. She can sing. She can play. She can have fun in her high heels. Um, <laughs> Um, she can pray and worship the house down. She is truly anointed of God. She shines. She shines. You may not know this, and she would never brag, because if you know Sister Patterson, you know that she is not one to brag about herself. Um, but at their annual ladies' meeting at, at General Conference, either last year or the year before, they all put, put ideas in for themes. And she picked shine, and they picked that. For, for the nation. It's not just Nebraska. It's for the nation. Shine is nation. So when you get on Facebook and you see Shine Conference in Louisiana or in Maine, um, that, that came from her. She is, she is so beautiful. She shines. And each and every year, isn't this beautiful? She dreams up these beautiful decorations. And she's so talented. Sister Patterson, we are going to miss you deeply. Please visit often. We have one of her babies here, so we know she will be back. Um, she's not going to stay gone too long. Um, and this isn't the last time we will see her. I love you. The Nebraska ladies love you. Thank you for all you have done. You are precious to us. It has been my honor to, to serve and to be with each and every one of you. And um, I also was honored to serve with Sister Huffman, and she taught me a whole lot. She helped me. And I know this will continue to grow and grow, and God is going to do amazing things in Nebraska. And I'll get to hear about them. I'm just sad that I won't be a part of this, that what God's going to do. But 
But I'm just so thankful that he's given me the opportunity to serve alongside each of you. And it will always be a place in my heart because 23 years is a long time. You can't sweep that under the rug. But it will always be there. And I'll, and I'll always just, you know, a phone call away. Please text me. Don't act like I'm gone, dead, or whatever, please. <laughs> because I need you. Even though I'm a state away, I need you. I need you. I need your friendship. And I love each and every one of you. God bless you. Ministries, Mother's Memorial shines a light that reaches across the world. It illuminates the path to education for a foreign student navigating the unknown. It shines in everyday moments by providing appliances to missionaries overseas. It shines in the dark places when a church planner has a medical emergency, an unexpected bill, or a vehicle repair. It ignites passion through North American Missions training events for church planners, taking the light further than ever before. It warms the hearts of a family as they welcome home their adopted child. It shines a light into hopelessness and gives new life a new chance through domestic and international adoptions. It shines like the morning sunrise on the Lighthouse Ranch for boys, helping to raise up godly young men. Mother's Memorial shines across the world because of you and your support. To find out how you can partner with us, visit ladiesministries.com. I mean, we just want to take a few minutes here to honor our um, top givers from the District for Mother's Memorial for last year. Um, we have... Let's see here. Coming in third place, Bethel Christian Ministries. Sister Michelle, will you come and take this for us? And they gave $1,279. Coming in second place was True Vine Apostolic, Sister Nielsen. There you are. <laughs> And they had an offering of $1,545. And coming in first place for last year with a total offering of $1,628 was Apostolic Worship Center. And Sister Marcia Anthony, will you come up and take this, please, for AWC? And thank you to everybody that gave. Thank you to everybody that gave an, an offering. Our, our district gave $3,000 over what we had the previous year, and that is amazing. So we're very, very thankful for that. Has this not been awesome? The presence of God, it's worth every penny we pay, is it not? I want to make a few announcements. First of all, Sister Patterson already said thank you to Bethel Christian Ministries. But I want to say it's wonderful to walk into a beautiful facility where they have done all kinds of work behind the scenes that we never see. Thank you, thank you. I've never heard one word of complaint from them. 
So tonight, when we take up our offering, I want you to know we're going to give part of that offering to Bethel. It does cost keeping these lights on, the electric bill, the air conditioner, thank God for air. Tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., Please be here if you have not registered. You know Sister Alicia. Woohoo! That's her. See that chick. If you haven't yet. At 9.30, the silent auction is going to begin for all these baskets, okay? Um, this goes towards Mother's Memorial, and it benefits your church. Give, give, give. And give some more. All right, nine. Uh, well, after that, Sister Cindy Miller will be speaking, and she's going to be doing that little drawing and giving me the navy blue teapot with gold. If you have any little tickets, make sure you put Angela Showalter on the back and drop it in, okay? And then after that, the banquet will begin at noon. So once we're done in here, instead of fellowshipping in here, let's run right around because the food's going to be waiting for us, and it's going to be nice and hot, except for the salad, and it should be cold. So, and then the banquet's going to last until about 1.30. After 1.30, we ask that everyone pitch in. Just, you know how that goes, many hands make light work. Pitch in, just if everybody will spend five, ten minutes, we'll have it all done. Bethel has to have church tomorrow, so we want to leave it in better shape than they presented it to us. <laughs> Sisters, if you will come, prepare to take up the offering. Let's all stand. We're going to do the same thing that we did yesterday evening. We'll come up front after we pray. But I do want to make a comment to you. I want to tell you a little story about something that happened years ago. I had a friend, they were uh, evangelist, her and her husband, newly married, very poor. Evangelists, no matter how she dresses, they're poor. And so she had $10 to her name. And in service one Sunday morning, she said, God, I'm going to give this $10 to you. And she dropped that $10 in the offering plate. And after service, one of her friends, not knowing anything, not knowing that she just put the last bit in, she felt impressed to write a check and drop it in her purse. And at lunchtime, Sonia said, Babe, I forgot. So-and-so said that they were going to put something in my purse. And she ran and looked, and there was a $100 check. Now, I'm not saying we should give to receive. That's not how it works with God. But we can be assured that when we give, God will always take care of us. And when we give, he multiplies it and returns it, just like God's word says. So let's pray right now, sisters. Dear Lord, thank you for this evening, for what you have done so far, for talking to our hearts. Lord, I ask that you speak to us, nudge us with what you want us to give to you. God, help us to give from a happy, glad heart. And Lord, I pray that you bless it and do meet the needs of your children. Thank you, Jesus, for all you do. In Jesus' name, amen.
greater, no one greater, no one like our God. There is none more able, Christ our Savior, great and glorious. may be seated. When we say it's a great privilege to be here, it is with all sincerity. It truly is an opportunity to come to partner with you in ministry, to come alongside and, and to help you, and there is really no greater joy for us than when we put that book back in your hand after you've purchased it, slip it in that bag, to know what a blessing it's going to be to you, but not just to you, to everyone that is impacted by what has impacted you. The Pentecostal Publishing House is a great opportunity and ministry tool for all of us, so we do count it a privilege to join with you in ministry. Tonight we have a few offerings for you. Um, we have a Spanish section, and we would... Uh, Love for you to stop by and see the books that we have. If you speak Spanish or you're in Spanish ministry, um, they're really some, some good books that we have this year for you, so we want you to come by and check those out. We also have great books on missions, so we have a mission section. This first book I have is written for children. It's called Pilot Benny's Amazing Amazon Adventure. If you've ever read any of uh, Benny DeMerchant's books, they're amazing. There is something about a missionary book that gets deep into your soul. It changes you from within. They said yes, a life in missions. The Rodenbush family and all that they have done. You say this is a pretty thick book, right? What great reading. I know we're taking one home. We give one of these to family members in our church that aren't able to come anymore, but what a way for them to travel. They're homebound, but yet every time we put a book in their hand about missions, they travel the world, and their faith is inspired, and they are great prayer warriors, though they hardly get to leave their house, but their prayers are global. What a great opportunity. And the last three books that are by our esteemed speaker tonight, Dr. Cindy Miller. First one here, Let's Talk, Understanding Yourselves and Loving Others. This is a great devotional book. You can use this as a daily devotion. You can use it for Bible studies. Uh, just wonderful material in here, and this will be a blessing to you. The next book, I Don't Want a Divorce. How important is this in our society today? 
She deals a lot with conflict resolution and just ways to empower our marriages. And this is a very important book, not only for you, but for those around you, because all of us know somebody that is struggling, don't we? And this will equip you and empower you to speak into their lives. And finally, we have an anthology. There are 14 chapters in this book by about 27 authors, and it's called The Apostolic Family, Insights for Living in the 21st Century. Now, we need this book. I am so thrilled that this book is here. And Dr. Miller has been a part of this and written a chapter on that. And when she speaks tonight, you'll be blessed, and this will mean that much more to you. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. Come by and see us. Have a great conference. Hello, I am Mandy Brown, and I am here to tell you a little bit about Missionary Kid Ministries. Maybe you've seen me over here in the boutique area, and you were wondering, what does MK stand for? stands for missionary kids. I am a missionary kid. My, I'm, the, I'm the daughter of a missionary kid, so they call that an MK squared. <laughs> what a privilege and a blessing it has been in my life to be a missionary kid and now to represent missionary kids and bring their stories to you. Just a little bit of information about what I have out there if you want to come visit me. In this area, I have some items. Uh, I have a lot of freebies. Love freebies, right? Yes. I've got a lot of freebies for you that kind of tells you how you can get Sunday school kids involved in praying for missionaries and getting to know our missionary kids because we have missionary kids. I mean, we just had one born a few weeks ago. <laughs> so we've got from there all the way up. My dad is one. So um, it's every age you could think of. Um, so we want you to know how your Sunday school kids can be involved with missionary kids, how your youth group can be involved with missionary kids, how your ladies group can be involved, and also if you have homeschoolers, we have some ideas for your homeschoolers to be involved in praying for and getting to know our missionary kids. One of the things you can do is follow us on social media. We have a very active Facebook page and Instagram page that kind of lets you know what's going on right now. And every Monday we have MK Monday where we bring you the story of one of our missionary kids and their needs right now. And so you can join with us that week and pray for that missionary kid. Uh, some of the other things I have to offer you out there is this little finger puppet uh, prayer kit, prayer buddies. And this kind of tells you how you can pray for each region, and it gives you a little finger puppet for you to, to be able to interact with your Sunday school kids or your kids. That is $5, and I also have some recipe cards that has some recipes from around the world, and they're made, it's made a little bit easy so you can do that with your kids as well and then pray for the missionary kid that's represented with that recipe card. But my favorite freebie is probably this right here. And this is our missionary kid prayer map. Um, I know a lot of you have probably seen the adult global missions map, maybe in your prayer room or you've, you've seen it around. And this one has those, those people's kids on it so that you can get to know them and pray for them and see their faces. I know, it's, it's pretty awesome. So that is something that we want you to take home with you. Come and see me, and I have got one for you for free so that you can pray for our missionary kids because although we are at, supported by partners in missions uh, missionary kid ministry is supported through partners in missions uh, more than anything and I'm seeing this more and more as I get involved with these young people we need your prayers and they need your prayers um, it's kind of unique for some of them being a missionary kid they travel with their parents and we believe that they are called with their parents. It's not just like God saw the parents and said, well, you have to go with them. No, we believe missionary kids are called to missions just like their parents are. But one of the things they leave behind sometimes is a strong youth group or a strong Sunday school ministry. And they are visiting different churches all the time or they are in a country where they are the only ones that know the truth. And we want to be supporting them with prayer. I have some pictures to show you. And this first picture is a little bit, it's an older one. You may even recognize some of the people there. But I was trying to figure out when this picture was taken. So I had texted a few of them and asked. And um, one of the young people texted me back, and she's an adult now. And uh, she said, you know, I remember when that picture was taken. 
that I remember it because it was a missionary kid retreat. And right before that week, I had made a plan to commit suicide. She said, I was just really lonely, and I was really struggling. But it was that missionary kid retreat that helped me to overcome that. It was that be- feeling of belonging that helped me to overcome that. So it was just a big deal and a big turning point in her life. And that's one of the things that Missionary Kid Ministry does. If you give to it, if you pray for it, that is one of the things that is providing is support for our missionary kids and a feeling of being at home. They, they say when they come to Missionary Kid Retreat, which is every other year, that it, we've heard so many missionary kids say, it's like we're, we're finally at home. We're finally finding a place of belonging. But in this picture, almost all of these kids represented, though it was many, many years ago, are adults and active in ministry, which is such a win. It's such a big deal that we have missionary kids that are now coming up into adulthood and being in ministry themselves. This next picture that you'll see is Gordon Smoke, and he was in the back in that van, and him and his wife are involved in training up children's ministers. This next picture is of him speaking at a children's conference in Paris where children were receiving the Holy Ghost this weekend. He was there, and what a win to be able to be a support to our missionary kids so that they are capable and able and, and willing to do these things, to be able to minister And we're excited about that. And next one is a recent picture of missionary kid Joshua Hayes preaching his first message with an interpreter there. And so they're doing great things, but not just as they grow up and come back to the States, but you'll see a picture here of the Gibbs family. These are their children, and they are there in a service in Malawi worshiping. The next picture, they're praying for people in their country. They're not just sitting by. They're not just waiting for their parents to be done with whatever work is happening that day. They are interacting and working. The next picture that you'll see is of the Herod children in Spain, and they interpret in Sunday school if they need to, and they lay hands on people to receive the Holy Ghost and to be healed. And if you go with them in their country, they're going to be witnessing to people wherever they go. So we are seeing great things done, not just through our adult missionaries, but through their kids who are called as well. This last picture, and I'm done, I want to show you. This is a picture of when our MK Monday was featuring our undisclosed MKs. You may not know it, but on this map, we don't have a picture of several kids that are missionary kids because it's too dangerous to show their pictures. We can't show you their faces and we can't tell you their names, but they are in dangerous situations, working alongside their parents. And we want you to pray that God keep his hand on them. Pray for them specifically. Pray that God would minister to them, that they would, one of the things that they, their parents ask for prayer for is that they would get build friendships in their country, build connections, that they would be able to have a good education, that they would be, of course, protected above all. So pray for our undisclosed missionary kids. Pray for all our missionary kids, and please come and see me for more resources about that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sister Brown, for your passion for the MKs. Amen? Amen. At this time... We want to, as she makes her way to the platform, we want to introduce you to Cindy Miller. Those of you that do not know her, I want to tell you a little bit about her. She lives in New Jersey with her best friend, ministry and partner, and husband, Stanton Miller. Together they pastor Calvary Tabernacle in Wrightstown, New Jersey. She holds a Ph.D. in pastoral care and counseling, care and counseling. Dr. Miller serves as a professor of practical theology at Urshan Graduate School of Theology. In addition to authoring five books, she is a columnist for Reflection Magazines and contributes to other UPCI publications. She also travels nationally and internationally speaking at conferences, training ministry and professional development seminars, and providing counseling Wow, consultations for UPCI churches and clergy, and she's my friend. And where is she? Oh, she's right here. We love you, and we're so glad you are here in Nebraska. And you're beautiful. Thank you for being with us. Praise the Lord. Well, uh, I was... Thinking earlier, I believe this is 
my third time, my third conference, I think. Uh, and I think the first time I ever came was Sister Wolf invited me. And then I was here with Sister Huffman. I don't know if she's here. Oh, I hear you. And then my friend Sherry. So, great times. Now, you're all really quiet. Does that mean church is over? <laughs> are you tired or you ready? are you just gearing up for the next thing, right? Oh, it's good to be back. It's good to be here. I, uh, I, told, uh, I told Sister Sherry when she picked me up, I said, well, I, I didn't want to scare you. I didn't let you know. But I am just recovering from bronchitis, and for five days I didn't have a voice at all. Now, my students at the grad school were very grateful and thankful. <laughs> End of semester, they're like, you want me to do what? I can't, I can't understand what you're saying. I'm saying. <laughs> uh, but I was praying like, oh, Lord, before, before this conference come, we need a miracle, Lord. And uh, so I'm thankful uh, to be able to have my voice back and to be here because I do believe that the Lord is with us. He has a word for us, and, and I want to share that word with you. Thank you to PPH for uh, advertising my books. We do have the new book out for uh, the uh, Family Ministries has put a book out, and I hope you will uh, make every effort to purchase the book, look through it. Uh, there are several different authors, and I think it will be a great help if you work with families. And what ministry? Our ministry is all about people and all about relationships. It's not just about how to get your finances in order and, and how to buy a better house. It's none of, those, none of those types of things. It's about your relationships. It's about loving God and loving others and how we're in relationship with him and how that plays out in our relationship with others. And, and if we don't do relationships well here on planet Earth, we're, then you can pretty much be assured you're struggling in your relationship with the Lord. Because how you do relationship with others is how you do relationship with him. They're, you're only one person. You don't have one way. You don't have a super spiritual, perfect, healthy way of doing relationship with him. And then when it comes to people, you just fall apart. And so these relationships we have with others enlighten us and help us to understand uh, what what's going on in our relationship with him and how he wants to work. Uh, I, I do hope you will purchase my books. I've read them. Uh, I, I prove. I have, I have the end. I threw some in my bag, and I'll have them out here. But I have um, character count, which at the table, it's Sister Mandy, right? Oh, thank the Lord. If it was, if it was like Sister Zoe, I'd be really embarrassed. If that's way off. Sister Mandy had told me that they had used that for their youth uh, as a youth Bible study. That, that encouraged me. It's good to know that after uh, several years and lots of reprints that the book is still effective and being used. I wrote the book <coughs> because uh, we, we were a church plant and people were coming to the Lord, brand new, no background in church, and... There was some just very practical things that needed to be said. Uh, it's amazing how people come to the Lord. I don't know if you've ever experienced it, but at the altar, you don't automatically get wisdom. That's a growing process. You don't automatically get up from the altar and receiving the Holy Spirit and have it all figured out. That's a growing process. And uh, realizing this growing process I wrote this, uh, this book, Character Counts, because it really does matter. How, whether you're brand new to the Lord and you have no background in Christianity, or you've served the Lord for all of your life, I found something to be true. Humanity has a way of justifying itself. Human beings, when they really want something, have a way of talking themselves into it being okay. And then we have to line our lives up with the word of the Lord. What does he say about it? So I only have 10 books left. They'll be up here tonight. 
I have one book on I don't want a divorce. Um, my sons were laughing about it when the book came out. They were over at uh, PPH at General Conference. They were at the book table. And they, I had gone to lunch. I came back, and they're like, Mom, people are so embarrassed to buy your book. <laughs> they're like, it's so funny. They come up, and they're like assuring us, I don't need this book. <laughs> but I have a friend who does. Like, so they said, so we started this whole new sales method. We'd see people kind of eyeballing it. We'd go, oh, we know you don't need this book, but everybody has a friend who needs this book. He said, they were just buying it. They're like, yeah, I don't need it, but my friend sure does. <laughs> so I know none of you need that book on marriage. None of you need that book. But boy, do you have a neighbor who needs it. Ooh, a friend. Lord bless you. Lord bless you. Y'all look so beautiful. It's good to be here. So this, this particular phrase has been on my heart all day. It started yesterday and it threw out today. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. When my heart is overwhelmed, it seems like not just this week, but particularly in the last couple of days, I think my life is like many of you. It's not a perfect life. It's, it's good because I have the Lord, but there's a lot of things in my life and stories and people. And this passage is so precious to me, Psalm 61, 1 through 4. Hear my cry, O God, attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth, I will cry to you. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in your tabernacle forever. I will trust in the shelter of your wings. Tonight, a precious precious friend of mine is, is sitting with her husband. They've been married 60 plus years and she's sitting by his bedside holding his hand, whispering her last I love you as he lingers and he's passing and we don't know if it's tonight or tomorrow or but within the next short time he's going to go and be with the Lord. And knowing that he's going to be with the Lord doesn't make the passing and the loss any easier. When my heart is overwhelmed. Tonight in a hospital room that has been her home for more months than she can count, there's a young woman considering what now and what's next. Her husband's left her, and she has a daughter that her illness has basically left her unable to parent when my heart is overwhelmed, when my heart is overwhelmed. Yesterday, a mother called me and, and was talking to me about her son. He was raised on a Pentecostal pew, and at one point in his young life, he was in my office telling me he wanted to be a preacher, and now he's a drug addict on the streets, and she hasn't heard from him in so long, and with tears in her eyes, she said, I just need to know he's okay. When my heart is overwhelmed, when my heart is overwhelmed. And then at the hotel today, I spoke with a young woman. She called and shared her heart. She left everything to follow the Lord, to follow her calling. But everything's been such a struggle. And today she's questioning not only her calling, but her ability to hear God's voice. And she's just exhausted from it all when my heart is overwhelmed. Now we can focus on the overwhelmed heart or we can focus on God who is very present, the God who has made a way of escape, the God who provides for us, the God who sees us right where we are right now, tonight. And that's really what I want to talk about tonight, I want to talk about the God who sees us, 
and our ability to be with the one who sees us, to see him who sees us. It's a familiar story. I'll give you the background to it. In, in Genesis, it's the story of Abram and Sarai and her maid, Hagar. And it was the custom of the day for Hagar, a servant, she was given to the master because his wife was unable to bear a child. And so she gave Hagar to her husband so that she could produce offspring on Sarai's behalf. And when this servant girl realized that she had conceived a child, she made a dreadful mistake. The Bible says she despised Sarai. And while she may have been carrying Abram's heir, she was still Sarai's slave. And what happened exactly is not explained. There's no specific details, but the Bible says Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. And I want to pick up the rest of the story. So we are in Genesis 16, and I want to start reading the rest of the story at verse 7. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. Ow. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, You are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. Now that's not very encouraging. My, my daughter-in-law is expecting a baby in June, and, and uh, she's praying, praying not only for Emery to be healthy, but for Emery to love to sleep at night, and for Emery to like to read books, and for Emery not to be as energetic as her cousin Grayson. She has a lot of prayers going up for her, so... I'm quite sure that hearing this was not encouraging to this young mother. But her response, now, mind you, he's given her two things. He met her, and he said, you need to go back and submit to the woman who abused you, who mistreated you, and you're going to have a son, and here's the bad news about him. That's not the kind of altar service we want to have tonight, right? You want to be encouraged. I mean, if you're going to hear a word from the Lord, you want it to be something like you're about to come into a lot of money <laughs> and, and you're going to start looking younger and not older and this time next year you'll be 50 pounds lighter. I mean, that's the, kind, that's the word of the Lord you want to hear, not this other nonsense. But here's her response in verse 13. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. You are the God who sees me. And I have now seen the one who sees me. And I feel like if, if anything at all was to happen tonight, it would be that we would have our eyes opened and we would see the God who sees us. So many times we come to conferences, we come to church services, we bring our burdens and our cares and we leave them at the altar. But I think not only just coming and trying to get a fix and a cure, but I think we need an encounter with the Lord. I think sometimes he's going to say, you know what, you're going to remain in this situation. It's not going to change. And here's the word to you, things aren't going to get better. But in the middle of all of that, what we would perceive as negative, she's saying, 
This, he's the God who sees me, and I have seen the one who sees me. Something encouraging happened to her there. It wasn't a negative. It wasn't a sad or depressed situation. She was encouraged by it. So here we see this desperate woman, vulnerable and alone, pregnant and afraid, fleeing, maybe running, trying to get back to her home country, fleeing across this hot burning desert in very vulnerable condition. But the angel of the Lord found her. Not as if he stumbled on her, but as if he went looking for her. What if the Lord had arranged to meet you here tonight for a purpose so that you could not only have your heart touched, your needs met, but you could have an encounter with him that would change your life forever. I found in my own life there's times that, that I have been in the presence of the Lord and I have been so changed by being in his presence that when I walk away from that encounter, even though the circumstances of life have remained the same, I am changed. Nothing stays the same because I am changed. And I approach everything about that situation much differently. To God who saw her, where are you going? Recently, I was, I was on a flight, uh, and I, I tell a lot of airplane stories, but that's because I live on airplanes. It's kind of like shopping. My daughter-in-law asked me, she said, is this particular store still open at the mall? I said, I don't know. I, I don't go to the mall, but I do know that store is open in Terminal C at the Philly airport, and they also have one in Atlanta. <laughs> that's where I shop, airports. But I was on a flight, and I was going to uh, preach a conference. And that week had been kind of a difficult week. There had been a lot going on. And I, and I went to get on the flight, and I thought to myself, I thought, you know, I just want to get on this plane. I want to kind of get my thoughts together, get myself together, maybe take a nap. It's a long flight. And, and when I land, I'm going to feel better prepared to be at this conference and I'm going to feel like I have pulled myself together, and this is going to be great. This is what I need, a long flight. And so I got on, got my seat. It's all good. Until a woman got on, uh, and, and just to, so you know before I go any further in the story, I have five grandchildren, and I love them all. I love children, okay? So don't panic when you hear me talk like this. But this woman was getting on, and she had two little boys, and they were like two and four. And apparently, these little boys were very happy to be on this plane. Very happy. They were, they were at the top of their voice singing about the plane. And they were chanting. And I don't know, it felt like hours and hours, but it doesn't normally take that long to board. But it just was loud, and it was just exuberant. And and they were screaming and laughing and calling to each other. And, and mom seemed a little bit oblivious to what was going on. And so if you've ever been on a plane with someone like that coming on to bless you, you know how it goes. As, as mom passes each row, you hear the sigh of relief. Oh, not our row. And so she keeps coming, and, and, and I'm just like, oh, Lord, oh, the spirit of intercession took hold of me. And, please, God, please. But as it turns out, right next to me, the three empty seats were hers. And she got, got her kids in, and, and, you know, they were happy to be there. I thought, this is not going to be one of those flights where you get much sleep. And so we took off, and she had their little trays down, and they were zooming planes and cars and throwing them up in the air and singing and, and reciting stories and letters and alphabet. And, and oh, my goodness, people were passing up mints. And, uh, I mean, all kinds of great things were happening, you know. And Mom, she was just kind of on her phone playing a game. 
She wasn't one of those mothers that gave them an iPad and put the earbuds in and said, go for it. Not one of those. And normally I admire that very much. I love, I love imagination. I love creativity. But just the flight went on. I thought about handing over my iPad. <sighs> it has all my sermon notes. It has all my lectures. Here it's yours. Keep it. Use it. Be blessed. And I was getting, I was just not really happy on that flight, is an understatement. When, when the Lord began to deal with me. And the Lord began to really challenge the way I was thinking about her and, and this situation. I hope, I can only say, I hope the Lord goes after you the way he goes after me. Because if he does, we're going to make heaven our home, I promise you. We're going to heaven. And, and so he challenged me about my bad attitude and the way I was thinking about all this and how I felt about it. And, and then the Lord prompted me, write her a note of encouragement. Oh, my word. That was like the last thing I was thinking. I know it was the Lord. It was not me at all encourage her but I don't argue with him there's no point he's gonna win got my little case out got my notepad got my pen what should I say so I started writing and I know it was from the Lord because it wasn't one bit for me you dear mom you are doing a great job I hear creativity and imagination Oh, I, it was sweet. I wanted to sign it, Love Jesus, because it was not for me. But in obedience to him, I wrote it as it was coming to me. I just wrote it. It was like, but I thought it was going to be weird enough without signing it, Love Jesus. So I just thought, we know who this one's from. And I folded it up and tapped her. And, you know, she looked up, and it was that look like, uh-oh, one of those women. And I handed her the note, and I went back to reading. And in a little bit, she tapped me on the shoulder and, and kind of reached over and pulled me towards her. And she said, thank you so much. That was so sweet. And then I'm, you know, I'm feeling kind of ashamed. Not, not much, but, you know, like a little, a smidge. And, uh, and I said, oh, I wanted to say... <laughs> Oh, trust me, it wasn't me, it was him, trust me. But she pulled me in, and she just got these tears in her eyes. And she said to me, she said, you know, this is my first trip alone with the boys since their father died. She said, he just died a couple of weeks ago, and I'm taking my boys and going to my parents, and I've got to figure out how to get our life back together. And then she said these words that haunt me. She said, thank you for seeing me. Mm. I don't know if she prayed that morning, God, I need something. Maybe she's an atheist, I don't know. But God saw her. Whatever the circumstances, whatever the condition, the God who sees saw this woman in her broken condition. And he put this grumpy old lady on the plane right next to her because he knew he could trust me to obey him. And it wasn't about me. It was about him wanting to touch her and wanting her to know whatever the reason she needed to be seen. I'm talking about a God who sees and cares and understands and knows. And, and I've given you so many extremes to start this out. I've given you the mother with the son. And these are all true and they're all happening right now as we're in this service. 
you know, facing death, the drug addict son, the very confused young woman, uh, the mom laying in the hospital. And then we have this woman on a plane. But in this room tonight, it's not limited to the most broken of conditions and the saddest of stories. But in all of our lives, there comes a point, whether trial or testing or just challenges of life, that we need to know there is a God and he sees us. Not only is there a God who sees us, but I believe this God comes looking for us in our discouraged place. When you feel like you can't take another step, you can't go another mile, when it seems like what's the use and nobody cares anyway, and we've all had a day like that, and you sit down and you maybe feel like giving up or at least taking a very long rest period. And then there comes a voice somehow God using his people says, where are you going? Where are you coming from? Where are you going? What's going on? He comes looking for us and you and I have the opportunity to have an encounter with a God who not only sees us but comes and meets us and provides for us a place and a space that we can in turn experience him in a way maybe you haven't in a long time. Tonight is an opportunity for you not only to be seen by the Lord, but if you want, you could leave here tonight having had an altar experience that says, not only has he seen me, but I have seen him. I have seen the one who sees me. You see, so many times in life, things are not really going to change. You're going to walk this walk. You're going to be on certain pathways. You're going to go through particular situations. Some things are just the challenges of life. Coming to church, coming to ladies' conference is not a guarantee that everything's going to get fixed and everything's going to be perfect and you're going to get out of some suffering. But sometimes you are just going to go through the same things that everybody else goes through. It's called life. But the difference, or it should be different, is not that we get out of it, but that there is God in it with us. Amen? God is with us in our circumstances of life. Are you able to worship the God who sees you? Maybe when you're running away. Maybe when you're wanting to sit down. Maybe when you're wanting to give up. Maybe when you're certain and all alone, but it is God who sees you. In Isaiah 41, we read of God's help for Israel. And this same help is available for us tonight. And this is what he says to us in verse 9. You are my servant. I have chosen you and have not cast you away. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. For I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand, saying to you, Fear not, I will help you. When my heart is overwhelmed. When my heart is overwhelmed, I don't have to, to turn. I, I'm a counselor by profession, but I will tell you, more than, more than seeing a good therapist, you need a, an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. More than talking to your friend and hoping they can give you an answer, you need an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. More than a good service where you jump and shout and run around, you need an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. We need, we need a, a maturity that says, I'm going to go and find myself a place of prayer. 
We need a maturity that says, I'm going to learn to wait on the Lord. I'm not going to be quick to get up and walk away, but I'm going I'm to plant myself somewhere, and I'm going to be willing to not only talk to him, but I'm going to be patient, and I'm going to wait until I hear him begin to speak to me. I don't know how long many of you have lived for the Lord, but I want to, to share with you that growing up, I was privileged to grow up with a mother who knew how to pray. I was privileged to grow up with a praying grandmother. But the nice thing about it was they didn't put me in another room so I wouldn't bother them. They put me right there with them. I learned to pray because I was at the feet of women who knew how to pray. I learned to pray and wait on the Lord because I saw it over and over every week, ladies' prayer meeting, every week, uh, ladies coming together seeking the Lord. We had moves of God, and I was a child privileged to be part of that, and I learned to pray. I heard intercessory prayer. When you grow up with it, it's not strange. But folks, are we hearing intercessory prayer anymore? Are we hearing travail anymore? Are we yielding ourselves to those encounters with God that it's not about, oh, come and perform for me, God. Come and do for me, God. Come and make me happy, God. But it's here I am, Lord. Here I am in your presence waiting on you. Here I am, God. What do you want? Why did you even want us all to be in this room tonight, Lord? What was your perfect plan? What is your ultimate goal? You think you got yourself here? What if it's the Lord that brought you here for kingdom purpose? Because either he knew you needed an encounter to keep you going, or he knows you need an encounter because there's days ahead of you that you need to look back to this night, to this service, and say, it was there I met the Lord. I can remember how many of you have memories of camp meetings, memories of youth congresses, memories of your calling, memories of when the Lord touched you. We look back, those are markers, those are, are memorials in our life that we look back to and we testify about it and we say, the God who kept me then is going to keep me now. The God who was with me there, he's with me now. The God who walked with me through these times, he's going to walk with me through this situation. We need the Lord. Anybody here feel like you need the Lord tonight? You need to see the one who sees you. In Job 23, 8 through 10, Job was, was talking and, and he mentioned, he said, I don't know. It was a discourse. He said, I don't, I don't even know where he's at. I look to the left. I look to the right. I go forward. He's not there. I go backward, but I cannot perceive him. When he works on the left hand, I cannot behold him. When he turns to the right hand, I cannot see him. And then he said this, but he knows the way I take. Let's stand together right now. I know that it's after nine. I know you've been in this room a long time. And I see, I see on your face you're tired. I can't make anything happen in this service. I can't make you want it. I can't make you seek it. But I can, I can assure you, God is here. He is here. And if you have a need, if you have a situation going on, if you're a sister or friend here tonight, and, and maybe I didn't call out your situation, but you have a situation, you're like other sisters in other states tonight. For some, it's a son. For you, it may be your daughter. For some, it's a spouse that's, that's dying. For you, it may be an illness. Some it's chronic illness. 
Maybe it's finances. I don't know your situation. But God sees us. He sees you tonight. And and that doesn't make me grieve or feel like I need to, to weep for five hours, but it makes me want to be with him. It makes me want to kneel at my seat or find a place of prayer and say, you see me. You see me and you know me better than I know myself. You see me, you know my heart, you know my struggle, you know the anger, you know the bitterness, you know the discouragement, you know the frustration, you know. And he's like, I do, I see you. And you can tell him all about it, but he knows, or you could ignore him, he knows. But I tell you, for those of you who would like to spend a few minutes and see the one who sees you, could you just come and come around the front and and we're going to just take a few minutes of seeking the Lord, if you would. Father, as we bring this service to a close at the end of a long day and, and a long evening, with women who have put so much energy to be here and effort. But you see us, Lord, like you saw the woman on the plain and like you saw Hagar in the desert and like you saw me in my particular sorrow and situation. And and tonight... We want to turn our eyes toward you. You know the way that we take. I pray for my sisters right now that our eyes would be open and our hearts would would be focused on you right now. The God who sees. The God who sees us. Let's just worship the Lord together, shall we?